Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 20 of Warsaw AI Meetup. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm happy that you are with us. Uh, and uh, I'm Pavel. I will be a host uh, of this event. And today I will have a pleasure to listen to three uh, great talks. Uh, the first talk was given by Krzysztof and uh, Michał. The title is Garage. Generative Augmented Retrieval Assisting Generation Enhancement. Uh, the second talk from Camille is about continual learning, meeting generative modeling. And finally, Conrad will tell about Long Llama Focus Transformer, contrastive training for context scaling. And as usually, uh, you are invited and welcome to stay with us uh, for, the, for the after party and, and networking. So it's a great opportunity to uh, meet some people and have a good time with us. Uh, a few announcements before we start. Uh, so from this episode, from this edition, Warsaw AI is officially, formally organized by Quantum AI Foundation and Ideas and CBR. So Quantum AI Foundation is a nonprofit organization that I founded uh, already more than four years ago. Uh, to support collaboration, education, and research in new technologies, especially quantum computing and AI. And IDEAS NCBR uh, is a, a company and a research center supported by NCBR. Uh, there are already uh, several great research groups, and we have two speakers from IDEAS today, so Camille and, and Conrad. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Allegro, our partner and sponsor, for hosting us for the next time. Uh, so it's, it's a great uh, venue for us, and we are happy that we can collaborate in the next academic year. Uh, and finally, uh, there was already an announcement on uh, our Facebook group, LinkedIn and Twitter profiles, and our mailing list that we started releasing uh, a weekly newsletter. It's called Warsaw AI News. So you can also subscribe and uh, follow us. And we are also looking for um, for editors, for people who would like to uh, join us and help in just releasing uh, the next issues of this newsletter. So if you are interested and uh, would like to learn about uh, some AI news from the world uh, and then help us in selecting the best, the most interesting news, you are welcome to, to join so we can talk about it uh, during the after party. And with this, I think we can start the first presentation. So, Michał, Krzysztof, welcome, and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Krzysztof Jankowski, and today I'm joined by Michał Janik, and we would like to present to you our work entitled Garage Generative Augmented Retrieval, Assisting Generation Enhancement. Uh, this is a work we did together with other auth authors, Michał Grotkowski, Antoni Hanke, and Grzegorz Prybysz. So thanks a lot. Okay, so let's start with a simple question. Who is the monarch of Great Britain? If we take Lama 2, the 70 billion variant, uh, we will get an answer that the current monarch is Queen Elizabeth II with very confident history and uh, other details. Uh, Okay, if we try to do the same with ChatGPT, we will get a similar answer. Uh, here we will also uh, get some more checks saying that ChatGPT is not sure, so maybe we should check it out. Uh, so as you can see, there are lots of problems uh, with large language models. Uh, first of them is hallucination, uh, where large language models output with very high confidence the answers that are absolutely wrong. Uh, also, as you saw, they struggle with factual knowledge, and this is very hard to update them or control what they know or what they do not know. But we can solve this uh, problem. So in the standard work workflow, as you could, could have seen, uh, the question is fed to a large language model, and we get an answer. But what we can do, we can augment a large language model with a knowledge base. It can be the whole Wikipedia, the internet, your internal documentation, whatever you want. Uh, and now when we ask a question, so the question goes into a large language model, but also it goes to a special model called Retriever, uh, which uh, gets the question and retrieves the relevant information from the knowledge base. Then this knowledge is passed to the large language model and 
uh, the answer is constructed easily. And you can, as you can see, as a result, if you ask again, who is the monarch of Great Britain? But now we s give a passage from Wikipedia, uh, which is up to date, we get a correct answer that uh, that is King Charles III. Okay, so that was easy, but uh, how do we retrieve the information from such database? Okay, so uh, one time think idea is to just use a pre-trained uh, neural model such as BERT to um, embed uh, all the passages and uh, the query also into a dense representation. And then uh, when uh, we uh, have at the inference time, we just look at the query, uh, look at its embedding and sele select the top k closest passages uh, to this uh, query embedding and then uh, we take these uh, passages and uh, give it uh, as a context to our generator. Uh, we can uh, obviously try to use uh, some more sophisticated model uh, than the base uh, BERT. We can also try to uh, use uh, the specific model chain to, um, uh, to uh, pass the... Um, uh, we can use the model that was trained to um, give similar embeddings uh, to the relevant passages uh, to a query. But will it work? Well, obviously, if you have a simple data set, uh, it can uh, work pretty well. But the problem is uh, uh, where, um, when we uh, have a complex uh, data. And uh, for example, uh, if we uh, have a domain that was very different than the training data for this uh, uh, um, large language model, we can find that the embeddings are uh, not able to capture the necessary information. And uh, we uh, will have a poor performance. We can try to fine tune uh, our embedding models and retriever, but uh, it usually is very, uh, very expensive and we would like to do it uh, in a cheaper uh, way without uh, so much resources. And how can we do it? Well, uh, a surprising fact is that we can just uh, get rid of the neural model uh, completely and uh, we can just use a classical uh, algorithm such as uh, BM25, best match 25, that in practice uh, works often much better than a neural model uh, meant it uh, doesn't require any mm, additional training. So, uh, shortly, what uh, this uh, BN25 algorithm does, it's, uh, you can think of it as a, mm, a s modification of standard TF-IDF uh, uh, method. It, uh, it, on one hand, it uh, takes into account uh, the term frequencies, so uh, more uh, mm, more time each uh, word is present in the document, the more relevant it becomes. And also it weights uh, each word uh, based on the information it provides. And uh, it's, uh, it's captured by the inverse document frequency. Mm, another possibility uh, is, is that we can just uh, forget about uh, trying to change our uh, retriever model and focus on the part uh, b uh, that, is, uh, that is before the retriever. So that is uh, the question itself. We can try to um, either modify the question or maybe just uh, expand the, uh, the query and add uh, some relevant context. So, so for example, taking the question that we had before, uh, who is the monarch of the Great Britain? We can uh, take uh, we can take this uh, query, ask uh, some some model to just generate relevant keywords that could help our retriever to mm, to to get the relevant passages, uh, such as uh, Queen, King, UK, etc. And then uh, we pass this modified query uh, to the retriever, and hopefully it uh, it has a better performance. And uh, one method of doing this uh, is, uh, was introduced in a paper called 
generative augmented retrieval. And uh, in this paper, the authors uh, propose that uh, in order to generate this uh, relevant uh, context, we can use a in simple uh, encoder-decoder uh, model uh, so that it, uh, as an input, it takes the query, the question itself, and as, as uh, in the output, it produces some uh, text, uh, uh, some text context. And what what could be this context really? Uh, how how can we train this model? So the others pro uh, proposed three different. Uh, ways of doing it. Uh, so they uh, either uh, try to generate the relevant uh, document itself, the whole content of it. They try to generate a title of the document or uh, the, they even try to generate the, the answer itself. Okay, so taking all these uh, blocks uh, we uh, have our proposed uh, architecture called Garage, and I hope that the name is clear uh, where, where the, the, it came from. Uh, Gar uh, and uh, Rag uh, uh, combined with the BM25 retriever. Uh, so we have uh, our query. This query is expanded using, using Gar model, and uh, it's, passed to, uh, the, to, to, it's passed to the retrievers. Uh, in this variant, it shows that gar uh, the, the augmented query is only passed to the mm, narrow retriever, but really we can uh, we can try def different combinations and pass it to the mm, classical retriever and so on. Okay, and when we, we when we get passages from BM25 and RAG, we we mix them, combine them, and pass it to the generator. But uh, what generator can we really choose to, to avoid uh, expensive training? Okay, so let's talk about the generator part. So actually we can use any instruction fine-tune uh, large language model. In our experiments we used ChatGPT as it was uh, the easiest one, but if you want you can experiment with more. If you have lots of passages you can try even uh, large language models with uh, larger context windows such as LongLama. Uh, so what we did here uh, is we prompted ChatGPT uh, with a special prompt engineering. Uh, your goal is to answer the question as briefly as possible, and we uh, gave the top retrieved uh, passages. Uh, here, these were top five retrieved passages, uh, and then and then we had the correct performance from the model. Uh, okay, let's talk about the evaluation now. So. What we mostly wanted uh, to focus is that when you have the models, they are gen they are most they are usually trained uh, on the whole internet corpus, Wikipedia. But when it comes to domain-specific adaptation, uh, that is what we wanted to focus. So we chose a special data set called COVID QA. This is a subset of 5,000 medical articles from COVID-19 data set. Uh, as you can see, we have an example question and answer. I won't be reading them because they are really complicated. Uh, and as you can see, uh, you might see why traditional models struggle here, even how to tokenize such hard words, uh, and how we can cheaply get good results with our approach. Uh, regarding our ensemble, here we have a plot uh, how how the, the neural retrieval from RAG and the classical BM25 uh, work separately depending on the number of retrieved passages. So here you can see the number of retrieved passages from uh, 1 to 20. And we plot the top K accuracy of retrieved passage. Uh, so um, the, our ensemble model outperforms uh, either the neural one or the um, classical one. And you can see that uh, the more passages we retrieve, the better accuracy is. Okay, so uh, let's focus on the results. Uh, we chose uh, two different tasks. One of them is retrieval and the second one is generation. As it comes to retrieval, we uh, evaluate the top five and top 20 accuracy, looking at uh, what is the accuracy of retrieved passages. Uh, and in this case, our model outperforms the baselines. 
the baselines are the, the new rally retriever rack, uh, the classical BM25, and the third model rack and to QA is a fine-tuned version of uh, the neural knit river uh, done uh, by other researchers. It took them six NVIDIA V100 GPUs and we did it only with one cheaper one. Uh, yeah, uh, what you can see here uh, when you see th the message uh, GAR rack and uh, all other mm, strange percentage uh, is the percentage of retrievers used in our assemble. So our best retriever was the augmented query using uh, the GAR model, which was, uh, no, sorry, no, yeah. So which was fed into the BM25. 20% 20 of top passages came from this model. Uh, then 40% came from BM25 and 40% came from RAC. Uh, we just interleaved the top retrieved passages. Uh, as it comes to the task of generation, we chose two metrics that were previously used by researchers, uh, the exact match and the F1 uh, score. Here we also uh, outperformed all, other, all our baselines uh, in the F1 score. Uh, the exact match looks at the exact match of the answer. So as chat GPT tends to be very verbose and we didn't train it, it was all uh, zero shot or maybe few shot with passages. Uh, so we didn't have a point here. Uh, we outperformed other models in the uh, F1 score. Uh, and again, our uh, our benchmark, our baseline models were the chat GPT zero shot, uh, the generated answer from the whole uh, rack pipeline, and again, uh, the fine-tuned variant um, of the neural retriever. Okay, so uh, we gave you some questions with the problems uh, of large language models at the beginning, so did we solve them? <laughs> okay, so uh, an obvious answer is that uh, we cannot really solve all the problems with, uh, without really fine-tuning our models, but uh, what is really, uh, really uh, inspiring is that uh, our simple, uh, simple uh, method uh, using those combined uh, retrievers uh, proved that we can uh, uh, really reduce uh, the hallucination that uh, the ChatGPT without uh, passages really had. As we can see that uh, if we uh, don't provide any passages, the model hallucinates, uh, hallucinates a lot, but if we provide relevant passages, uh, it uses uh, the, uh, the passages when it's uh, relevant, and uh, if it's not, it refuses to answer without provided information. Mm, what is interesting is that there is a lot uh, of things that can be explored in this, uh, in this topic. So, for example, uh, one uh, really uh, uh, promising uh, way is to train both the retriever and the um, generator uh, jointly uh, so, so we can avoid some problems like, uh, uh, for example, Meta in uh, this year pr proposed a way of training um, the generator so that it really knows that it can uh, it, uh, it can use these passages, so uh, we, we uh, create a new data set with uh, queries and passages, and uh, we train it uh, end to end, so that the generator learns to use the passages. Uh, we can also, uh, li like with it, we can try to um, take different d retrievers and uh, s mix them or uh, maybe try to distill the knowledge of different retrievers into one powerful model, like Dragon, for example. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, spoke about uh, passage re-ranking. It's also really beneficial to, uh, after retrieving many documents, to re-rank them and uh, take only the most relevant, uh, best passages uh, to the generator. And uh, obviously, we can uh, try to mm, mm, change uh, our prompt to the generator, or maybe try to mm, make some uh, kind of chaining uh, these prompts to, to create better, uh, better results. So to sum up, uh, with uh, usage of some uh, neural retrieval uh, mixed with classical retrieval, we can try to 
outperform fine-tuned models on a hard domains uh, without much resources. So uh, that was it. Thank you my, uh, very much for your attention. All right, so now it's time for questions to our great speakers. Do we have questions? Maybe I will ask uh, first. Um, so uh, how much time did it take for you to train uh, this model on just a single GPU? And can you maybe also compare it to the training of other methods? OK, so most of our work we did was um, only the inference without training uh, the model. So uh, when we talked about the neural retriever, so it was uh, all without training. Uh, also, the classical model, uh, it's not a neural one, so we didn't train it. Uh, the only model we uh, had to train was the query augmentation uh, model. Uh, so actually, it was cheap to train it. It took less than two hours on a single uh, NVIDIA A4000 GPU. Uh, actually, we wasted some, uh, some compute to train it because at first we tried to train it to augment the query with the relevant uh, answer, but it was it wasn't enough information for the retrievals to actually capture it. So later we uh, switched to predicting the whole passage. Uh, and yeah, comparing to fine tuning the large language models um, previously, like in the previous paper that they used six NVIDIA V100 GPUs for lots of hours. So yeah, it's much cheaper. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. And do we have some other questions? Okay. So thank you. It was a uh, uh, good uh, talk to hear. So, uh, what do you recommend, let's say, that uh, I want to solve for my specific uh, like uh, retrieval augmented generation task? So do you recommend that I use like uh, like for, for this like a scoring function, uh, like the BERT model or like this uh, BM25, or I like fine tune my own, ver own version to my like a specific uh, like needs? If I want to like apply this method to my specific data, what would you recommend? Uh, like the specific steps to mm -hmm. to sure. yeah. Thanks, thanks for the question. I think that first of all, you might try to um, you just ju just use a, a powerful retriever. Recently, um, a new retriever was created. It's called uh, Dragon. Actually, Dragon Plus. There are different variants. Uh, this is a very interesting retriever because what researchers did is they took uh, a neural retriever, size is comparable to BERT, and they distilled the knowledge from more than three other retrievers. So they trained it in a contrastive way to first led to how to retrieve based on the neural embeddings. Then they use other uh, sparse representation retrievers, even like classical, even multi-vector. So they all like mixed all that into one single uh, powerful retriever. So I think that first it would be good to uh, check it out if it works. Uh, because it uh, really depends on the uh, on the um, how, how how specific is the domain if it uh, contains many uh, hard words or some strange acronyms or other stuff. Uh, so I think that it will be the first step. Uh, and then if it does not work that well, I think that such steps by combining uh, um, combining a neural retrieval of BM25 is good, because the neural retrieval will capture the whole semantic meaning uh, special words, and BM25 will focus on these domain-specific names. Uh, what I think is also if you n exactly know what your domain is, you can try to look for uh, variants of BERT trained on specific uh, domain. Like, uh, I guess you, you, you could find like medical or engineering BERTs. Uh, I think that will also work well. And then fine tune if you, if you have the budget. So. <laughs> Great, thank you. Hope it answers the question. Do we have more questions? Is is the code uh, of your solution available publicly so that people can take it and play with it? Or not yet, but but we plan to do Fine. that. Okay, yeah. good. Would be great. I, are you maybe planning a scientific publication or maybe? Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, all right, we are ahead of time but i think we can we can proceed if there are no questions so thanks let's thank once again our great speakers thank you thank you guys hello everyone
that's better. Uh, okay, so my name is Camille Day. I'm a postdoc at uh, IDEAS and CBR. I also work for Warsaw University of Technology. And I'm happy to, to talk today about uh, continual learning. And uh, since that uh, meeting is uh, generally about generative modeling, I will also focus a bit uh, mostly on uh, how we can use generative models in continual learning, uh, which is a very close to, to my heart uh, field because uh, I worked for, for, for this domain mostly. So uh, as, uh, as Pavel already mentioned, I'm uh, working for IDS uh, and CBR and in particular for one group that is called, that we call Zero Waste uh, Computer Vision Group that is led by Tomasz Czynski, who also co-hosted co this uh, meet meetings earlier. Uh, so what I wanted to, to just mention is that we have a very nice group there working on the, uh, a lot of interesting projects uh, that are in general uh, in this um, idea of uh, how to uh, make ML more efficient, but not efficient in a way that we want to fine tune, uh, we want to ch change how um, convolutional layers are implemented in Python or something like this. We want to make efficient solutions in a way that um, we want to make our algorithm uh, smart, for example, to reuse some of the computations that we have or to reuse some of the knowledge that is already in there, um, in particular, like, uh, for example, in uh, continual learning scenario. Uh, I'm a member in particular of the continual learning group so th that is led by Bartłomiej Twardowski, who some of you might know for, from Allegro. Uh, and uh, this is why today I will be presenting uh, our works on continual learning. Uh, but before I move to, to solutions, let me start with the brief introduction to the problem. Um, let me start with a very simple example. We have a, let's say, classifier that we want to train to distinguish between horses and frogs. Uh, with recent advances, we can, I, I, I guess that, I hope that 100% of you can easily train a model that will have a pretty good performance on, on this task and will have a very good accuracy. But now let's assume that Okay, we have a very nice model that can distinguish horses and frogs, but what now? Maybe we can um, reuse this model and maybe we can uh, add something more. Like for example, let us take the same model and try to add two more classes. If we do it in the simplest possible way, if we, way, if we just add two more outputs to the classifier and we take some additional photographs on cars and planes, of cars and planes, for example, and we retrain the model on, the, on this new data set, it will perfectly adapt to this new knowledge. It will perfectly, it, it will have a very good uh, performance on distinguishing between cars and planes, but it will totally, or how we call it, catastrophically forget all of the previous knowledge about, knowledge about horses and, and frogs. So it will have very low performance. This problem that, uh, that we have in here is called catastrophic forgetting. If you think about it, we actually use it a lot in uh, fine tuning of models in transfer learning. We take the model that was trained on something different and we use actually catastrophic forgetting to fine tune it to, to our own data. Uh, but in general, this feature is rather a bug <laughs> because we uh, don't want to, to waste the computations that we already had to, to learn about horses and frogs. And if you think about uh, all of the other aspects of uh, all of the other machine learning tasks that we can think of, Catastrophic forgetting really happens everywhere in not only in classification problem, but also what I will mention to today, also in problems like uh, representation learning or uh, generative modeling. So uh, let me know, uh, since we have a problem, we might have already some solutions. And uh, in general, we have th this big domain, of what we call continual learning methods that try to somehow solve the, this problem of how to actually adapt the model to new data without forgetting all of the previously ac accumulated knowledge. And in general, there are four most, uh, four, let's say three and a half uh, most common approaches on how we can try to do it. Uh, I will briefly mention um, all of them basically, uh, but just to, to, to show you some lights, uh, to, to, to show you some thoughts, um, the, the first method, the group of methods that we call regularization is based on the idea that we can select an important part of the knowledge and try to not overwrite it with new data. The second part, uh, architecture modification, is the idea that we can add some additional parameters to the model and retrain the model on the new data using only those additional parameters so that the, the model uh, trained on the previous task is, remains the same. And we have two more approaches that can be combined together, 
uh, that uh, basically say that, hey, we, we cannot really prevent forgetting. Our brains also forget. Uh, I, I think that if I ask, uh, ask you for uh, to, to quote me, for example, the beginning of Pantadeus, which you, uh, you probably, I, I, I don't know, maybe someone remembers all of it, but uh, probably we don't remember it at all uh, because we didn't rehearse it. So the idea in here is that we can rehearse some uh, examples, we can repeat the knowledge that we knew before in order to maintain it. Uh, okay, so let me move closer. Let, let, let me uh, show you closer how the first group of uh, uh, methods work. So the methods that are based on the regularization. And I already mentioned that um, in general, what we have in machine learning is that we, especially for classification, we use really over-parameterized networks. So you can easily get rid of half of parameters and the performance won't really drop. So maybe when we want to retrain the model uh, updated on the new task, uh, what methods based on regularization uh, do, they, they uh, propose to find in, a, in some different ways uh, the important ways. So those ways that are really important for to perform the, the task, like for example, distinguishing those horses and frogs, and either freeze those weights or try to not change them too much so that we can uh, really uh, use them in the future uh, to, to still perform well on this previous task. And one part of this uh, general idea on how we can do this uh, regularization is that we can actually also use something that is known as uh, knowledge distillation, where instead of selecting those important weights uh, that we want to um, focus on, we can actually uh, focus on re retaining some part of the knowledge uh, by transferring in directly from the model that was trained in the previous task to the mo not model that is trained on the new task. So for in our scenario, we can take the model that was trained on horses and frogs and we're updating it on uh, planes, and, uh, uh, planes and cars. We can uh, at the same time distill knowledge from the model that was trained on horses and dogs uh, and uh, horses and frogs uh, into a model that was trained on uh, planes and cars. And th this general idea uh, works relatively well, let's say. Uh, but what we recently studied in one of the works from our group, uh, led by Philip, is that um, the crucial, the, the very important part is that we, we should actually adapt the teacher to the new data before we try to use it to distill knowledge from it to the new, new model. And so by simply updating the batch normalization uh, statistics, uh, what, what, what we showed was that uh, we can really improve the performance of the model uh, of, of this knowledge distillation, uh, thanks to the fact that teacher itself was adapted to the, uh, to the new data task. Uh, okay, so this was one of the idea of how we can use regularization methods. Uh, for preventing forgetting, but I also mentioned to you that uh, continual learning and uh, generally speaking, catastrophic forgetting is not only related to the problem of classification. And here is an example uh, that I wanted to mention um, that we also have a significant problem when we want to update models that are based on that are trained in a uh, self-supervised way. So models that are trained without super without uh, labels. Uh, in general, for in this um, group of methods, what we really want is to take training examples and try to embed them in this in some latent space that have some uh, dimensionality. And uh, what you can see here on the right are the, those are the embeddings for different uh, photographs of uh, birds. And if we take the model that has this kind of embeddings, and now we try to fine tune it on some other, we we want to retrain it on some additional birds, uh, the representations will shift. We call this problem this, uh, the drift of the semantic drift of the representations, and uh, this is the problem. Of the, 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 this is what we can observe as catastrophic forgetting of, the, of those models. Uh, so, uh, in general, uh, the, this problem is uh, is severe. But uh, what uh, what is known as let's say common knowledge in the community is that, in general, those uh, semi-supervised, uh, self-supervised methods are. Uh, let's say, uh, more um, uh, do, do not suffer from catastrophic forgetting in the same way as uh, supervised methods, because um, those representations through, uh, that are, those, this representation drift is much smaller than what we can see in supervised uh, learning. 
And what uh, we shot in the recent study that was led by Daniel, who's sitting in there and will be very happy to answer all of your questions, uh, is that this is mostly thanks to the additional uh, neural network that we have in the, all of the um, self-supervised methods that we call projector that uh, that mostly suffer from from uh, forgetting while uh, the remaining of the model is uh, kind of uh, thanks to it it, it, it is not uh, it does not suffer so much okay uh, those were the two approaches uh, to to two ideas of how catastrophic forgetting content and uh, uh, continual learning is used in classification and um, and uh, self-supervised methods. But uh, what I wanted to really mention is what happens when we uh, when continual learning meets generative modeling. And uh, I think this is a very interesting um, research direction that that I personally want to pursue together with a few other and uh, the PhD students in, in, in our team. Uh, so when we speak about continual learning and generative models, as I already mentioned, one of the ideas is that to, what, what normally comes to mind is that we can refer to this idea of rehearsing those previous examples. So I already mentioned that uh, there are those methods that, try, that don't try to prevent forgetting, but they already say that, hey, forgetting happens, but let's try to somehow rehearse the previous knowledge. And we can either do it by simply storing some examples in the buffer and retrieving them, or we can use generative model to learn previous tasks and try to feed, to, to give us some uh, memories from the, from the past, let's say. Mm, in our recent studies, we show, showed that uh, we can easily um, and so, so this idea of rehearsing examples that are sampled from the generative model is the the simplest approach. But we can uh, what we showed is that we can easily easily uh, improve it by uh, combining it with knowledge distillation and with the idea that we call cycling, where, where we actually try to create some better rehearsal examples than than, than the original ones. Uh, but this is just this. This was just the simplest idea. What we can really use the generative model as a some kind kind of um, one model that is serving the, as a rehearsal example, uh, as a source of rehearsal examples for another model, like for example for a classifier. But in general, what we uh, studied so some time ago is that uh, generative models are in in general more mm, prone to uh, more the, the representations learned by generative models are uh, more robust uh, against catastrophic forgetting than the representations that are trained in the discriminative way. So in general, if we uh, learn to not only to discriminate between two things, but when we learn to generate uh, one thing, uh, we learn much more uh, robust representation, much, much, more, much richer representation that is harder to actually forget, to, to be overwritten by some other representations. And this is why we also came up with another paper where we uh, proposed a method that we, uh, where we uh, continually consolidate the knowledge inside of the uh, generative model. In this case, it was variation of the encoder. It was generative. Uh, we, we further um, also extended this idea to generative adversarial networks. And now we are um, working uh, on uh, finalizing experiments to show uh, that we can actually use this uh, consoli knowledge consolidated inside of the generative model for some downstream task, like for example classification. Um, the results are almost there, so we are we hope to publish them pretty soon. Uh, but uh, since th those were uh, mostly uh, works that were done on VAEs and CANs, I, I wanted to also mention that we 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 also moved to to uh, the newest ideas uh, like. Uh, when, for example, when you think about generative modeling in uh, images, what you think of right now is probably diffusion models. So, uh, of course, diffusion models are the important part of uh, of generative work right now, and um, we already have some papers that, uh, in generally, uh, measure how the, the forgetting happens in in diffusion models. And there is an interesting part that um, actually. Uh, this forgetting doesn't happen the same way in all of the diffusion process. Um, it mostly happens in in the first steps of the diffusion process, where the model is trying to uh, generate new feature out of uh, random noise. 
Um, this is a one very interesting insight that uh, is worth, I, I think, digging up. Mm. Of course, we can try to, uh, when we think about continual learning of diffusion models, they also suffer from uh, catastrophic forgetting, but we can, uh, one might think that we can easily just take the samples from diffusion model and feed them back to, to train the diffusion models on, on the same samples, not to forget them. And we can actually, uh, of course, we can do it, but as some papers show, uh, there is some degradation of, of the quality of samples. There is a very nice recent paper where you showed that, that where authors, authors show that uh, there are pretty some uh, funny random effects on the faces of the celebrities when you try to retrain and retrain and re retrain generative models in, on, on the same data. Uh, but what I wanted to mention in here was that we can also use diffusion models to try to explain how uh, forgetting happens in classifiers. So in here you can see some generations from the standard uh, diffusion model in here. But we also uh, used what is called classifier guidance to, to show how the forgetting happens when we first train the, mod the classifier on the first task where we had planes and cars. And then we, uh, we took this model aside and we uh, took the copy of it and we fine tune it on the another data set that all only contained um, cats and birds. And what you can see in here, are, there are, those are some visualizations of how, uh, what, what are the uh, examples, for example, in here that were classified as planes by the first classifier, but are right now classified as birds. So this is the uh, forgetting in, in its essence. Those are examples that are not cor correctly classified anymore because they were forgotten. They were clearly overwritten by this bird class. Similarly here, uh, those are clearly cars that were overwritten by the cat uh, category. So this is what we can see as uh, as forgetting. Okay, uh, last but not least, um, interesting approach. Uh, I was all the time talking how bad is uh, forgetting in, in, in different models. But actually, and I also said, said that it's a back not the feature, but there are some works that uh, uh, think the other way, the opposite. So uh, there is, for example, this work that uh, claims that it's actually a feature, not a bug, uh, because for some uh, use cases, we actually want to forget. Uh, there, are, there is a growing field of uh, mm, works uh, that, that try to actually enforce this forgetting of certain examples. Uh, or even try to unlearn some uh, concept from uh, based on some training data. So, for example, uh, if we have, uh, I don't know, DALI that we trained on all of the available data, we can easily generate some nudity with it. Uh, but maybe we don't want to do it for, for some safety reason, or we don't want to generate um, faces of celebrities because we, we don't have uh, rights to, to do so. And in this case, um, what, what is done right now, um, in in all of those APIs that you can use, uh, you can see that sometimes uh, the the whole generation process goes on, and at the end, you just got an info that okay, we won't show you what what we generated, because it's all generated and then classified as as wrong. <laughs> uh, so instead of this, there are some works that try to really force the model to forget uh, those concepts that we don't want to generate. It's not an easy task. It's uh, because forgetting is as hard as trying to remember actually. <laughs> Okay, so this is the end of my talk. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them right now or right later during the party as well. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Kami, for a great presentation. Let's thank the speaker. Okay, do we have questions, Kami? I know that the phenomenon of catastrophic forgetting is to some extent related to a thing called the shadow model attacks because these models, for example, may force uh, some overriding in a model. Uh, it, does, that, does this mean that such continual learning strategies may actually help to protect against this kind of attacks on models? Uh, I, I'm not super familiar with shadow model attacks, uh, so this is, I guess, some, some idea of uh, adversarial attacks on models, right? Uh, it's uh, all super complicated and entangled together, but uh, in, in general, if we have more robust representations, they are, let's say, m m less prone to forgetting. So maybe in this way it is connected and uh, at the same time, most more, more, more robust representations, more, uh, more, let's say, informative representations might be 
as well um, better to, to counteract some uh, adversarial attacks. So in this context, yes, but uh, also some methods that are explicitly trained to uh, to prevent uh, those attacks, uh, they also suffer from from the forgetting because it's um, in the nature of the optimization with uh, with gradient based optimi op optimization basically. So it's not so easy to to, to prevent it. Okay, good. I hope that answers the question. Do we have more questions to come in? So, how would you describe uh, cases when uh, when actually using generative modeling would be better than using replay buffer or replay buffer plus uh, knowledge distillation? Like mm -hmm. knowledge distillation looks frugal <laughs> enough, I would say. Uh... Well, so so in general, those buffer methods work, work let's say, the best, let's say, uh, much better than, than those that are based on knowledge distillation. So I, I would say that it's always better to do it like this. But uh, the, the question of continual learning is not, uh, actually, I have to it, it right here. <laughs> uh, so um, is the exemplar free setting realistic? This is basically what, what you're asking, whether we, we should even consider the fact that we, we, we shouldn't have uh, access to the training data. And the, the answer to this question is that maybe with some approaches like based on those generative models or based on knowledge distillation or based on other approaches, um, we can not only focus on the fact that we don't want to forget, but we really want to reuse the knowledge that we have previously in stored in a model. So for example, the, I only mentioned the most important um, problem that we are uh, dealing with in continual learning, which is this catastrophic forgetting. But it's also very important to uh, to really reuse, uh, to, 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 to have some forward and backward transfer, what we call so some transfer of knowledge from the previous task to the no, to the new task. Like for example, if previously you learned to distinguish you know, cats from planes, and now you want to distinguish deers from, uh, I don't know, ships, maybe some features that you used previously to, 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 to learn what is the cat might also, also be useful to, to learn what is the deer or something like that. Okay, so it's as much as just transfer learning. Yes, yeah, so, not so only just basically with buffer, you don't have any possibilities of learning any trans to, to transfer knowledge from from one to another task, right? And with these generative models, it might be uh, a, a, what we're tr trying to do, and actually what we should have showed also in one of those work is that we can um, while learning on one task, it's always easier to learn on the second task. And moreover, it might if we do it right uh, while learning on the second task, we can still even improve uh, the performance on the previous task. Okay, so it's not only about not forgetting the previous task, but yeah, also but about it. improving the next task. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks for the question and thanks for the answer. Do we have more questions to come in? So maybe I will ask one. So. Uh, at the end of your presentation, you said that uh, uh, forgetting is actually uh, at the same difficulty level as learning, more or less. I'm not sure if I remember understood correctly. Do you think that it has to be like this, or uh, maybe there are some reasons to think that in the future one of these tasks may be more difficult? So I'm, ju I'm just, just thinking that in case of learning, as we said, we can use transfer learning or take advantage of some other knowledge that we've learned uh, in the past. Uh, so maybe from this perspective, learning could be easier than forgetting, but I don't know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, so in this case, learning might might be in general easier than forgetting. Uh, actually, uh, but but learning without forgetting this is the the the, 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 the toughest part. And uh, funny thing is that in this work that I showed with Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, uh, they actually used uh, continual learning methods to. Uh, but they optimize the networking the other way around to to enforce this forgetting. So it's really like entangles all, to, all together that if we want to prevent forgetting, we can actually use the same tools to uh, enforce forgetting. So in this way, I think that's, uh, that it's, it's very entangled. Good, thank you. Do you have more questions? If not, then let's thank once again thank Camille for the script. All right, and now it's time for our third speaker, Konrad. Hello, everyone. My name is Konrad Staniszewski. Today I am going to present 
the results of our paper focus transformer contrastive training for context scaling and a family of models that we have managed to create using our methods that is long llamas this is this was a joint work of our team at ideas and cbr that consisted of uh, Szymon Tworkowski, konrad stanishevski that's me Mikołaj pacek and piotr miłoś and our at the time collaborators from google tony wu and henrik michalewski our paper has been recently accepted to new hips <laughs> okay so the problem that we tried to solve in a better way is called language modeling. So what's language modeling? So given a language represented by large text corpora, we want to learn a function that given a prefix of a text will return a probability distribution on the next word. Yes. And in long context case, we are just interested in uh, conditioning this function on, on large prefixes of text. Okay, so why language modeling? Imagine that we have created such a function and that our uh, language corpora consisted of, for example, the documentation for the slang system. So then we can use our function to just compete uh, statements about slang, slang system, yes? For example, we can extract knowledge from the documentation in a more, in a more human, way, human way, okay? So, Next, if our language corpora consisted of, for example, Python code, we can use our function to complete this code. We basically just give this as an, as an input and just greedily take most probable to, uh, words. <laughs> okay. And also we can write summaries of text. Okay. Basically, we just take a text, we give it to our function, and we add this suffix, the short summary of the text above, above is as follows and we use our function to complete it. Okay, so the standard approach to solve this problem is to use transformer-based models. We basically take our large text corpora. We wouldn't want to deal at the level of words because there are millions of words. And also we don't want to deal at the level of letters for complexity reasons that I will come back to later. So we will just deal with tokens. So basically we will just speed this text into small parts. There will be about 30 to 50,000 of different parts that we call tokens. For example, the word habitat can be split like that. Okay. And we just train the transformer model with language modeling objective on, on our data. So what are, so what will this model do? Okay. So it won't see the whole text. It will just slide through it using a fixed context window. And for each token inside its context window, it will generate a vector of real numbers. It will then uh, pass these vectors uh, throughout the layers of the model. And in each layer, the attention mechanism will be used. That is basically each of those vectors will be converted into three more vectors, query, key, and value. Each of those query vectors will be matched against each preceding key vector and the values will be aggregated based on that matching. And a couple, couple of more operations will be performed that are not important here. And in the end, the model will output for each token inside this local context, the probability distribution on the next token, okay? So maybe those details, details are not really important here. This is an oversimplification of the transformer maybe. <laughs> but uh, what I want you to remember is that the attention is quadratic. Each query is matched against each preceding key and everything inside ha uh, is um, happens using real numbers yes okay so what are the limitations of this so first as i said uh, if you want to increase the context length two times you will increase the complexity of attention four times because attention complexity is quadratic in the vanilla transformer models the other thing is that Imagine that you want to teach your model something new, yes? It was mentioned before that knowledge inside those language models is stored as just a bunch of real numbers. And it is really, for example, not clear how to remove a specific part of the knowledge without altering other parts of the knowledge. And also how to add new knowledge without forgetting something, <laughs> yes? So let's come back to this first approach. That is maybe we can just add knowledge to our model by just provi providing it inside the context, yes? 
So first, as I said, we have the problem that the attention is quadratic, but there are two more problems with just giving the new information to the modern set the context. So the first problem is that transformer models t tend to be distracted by the additional informations. So basically, you can get worse performance from giving more input data. And they also tend to handle the input in an uneven way. In particular, they tend to pay less attention to the middle of the input. Let's look at this picture from the work of Nelson. This dashed red line is GPT 3.5 uh, Turbo that is just given a question, and it needs to provide an answer. And this uh, blue line is the same model, but in addition to this question, the model is given 20 documents, but only one of those documents is related to the question. So as you can see, if this related document is either at the beginning or at the or end of the input, the model can perform better. <laughs> But if it's in the middle, the performance is even worse than the performance of the baseline model. Okay? So it can be problematic. You give more data and <laughs> you get worse, worse results. Okay, so to alleviate uh, some of these issues, we proposed a method that we call FOT, Focus Transformer. It is inspired by the contrastive learning. It aims to prepare the model for long context. It can be used for both training and fine tuning. Does not, it does not introduce new traini trainable parameters. The changes to the architecture are minimal, and uh, this is basically a plug-and-play method. So how does it work? So imagine that we have a model that was trained initially with a context of length 2K. Now what we do, we select a subset of its attention layers. For simplicity of this presentation, I will just stick with one layer. And we allow this layer to look at the previous context. It's basically we allow attention in this layer to attend to keys from the previous part of the currently read document and to a couple of contexts from other documents. Okay, so basically here, for this one layer, we simulate this multi-document scenario. Yes, the attention in this layer C can attend both to the previous context and a couple of other contexts from different documents. And we, basically make it everything here differentiable and also we don't tell the model which parts here are relevant and which are not the model needs to learn good keys and queries in order to distinguish between this re related part that is this previous part of the document and this other par parts coming from different documents okay so it might seem a little bit complicated but it can be really easily implemented at the level of data loading and a uh, small change to the attention, in this one layer. So basically imagine that those gray rectangles are your documents and that, that the context of your model was initially 2K, yes? So now you would just extract for each document 4K tokens and you would treat first 2K as if they were the previous context, next as if they were the current context, and you will pack them into the batch like this, and you will just allow this attention in this one layer to look across the batch. So basically, now in batch you have, for each document you have two entries, and you allow the attention to look across the batch. Okay, so simple as that. So now, what about the inference? In the inference, uh, the model will again uh, scan throughout the input with its original context, but this one layer will have access to these previous keys and values. It can be either full dense attention that is still quad quadratic, or you can use a uh, can nearest neighbor search here to approximate this attention. Basically, you can, for each query inside this layer C, you can uh, pick top K keys according to the inner product, and the most match basically to these queries, and just approximate the full attention using this scanning neighbor search. So the model will just scan throughout the text, and uh, this one layer C will have access to all the previous parts. Okay? So now, what are the uh, results? So, as I said before, if you take the standard transformer model, and you just give this model a couple of documents, but only one of them will be related to what the model is currently predicting, then 
it can turn out that the mass of the attention dedicated to this related document is about one over the number of given documents, yes? As you start to use uh, our method, this FOTD equals one is you just give the positive part. You don't give any negatives. That is just the previous context. Then the result is still similar, yes? But as you increase the number of negatives, that is, for example, this FOTD equals eight is one positive previous context and seven other contexts, you can see that the amount of attention dedicated to this related document is uh, bigger and bigger, okay? And this FOTD equals two and then 64 means that we start with one positive, one negative, and then switch to one positive as 63 negatives. Maybe one thing important here, if you just start with this D equals 64, it can turn out that the model will just skip this layer. It will use this skip connection inside the transformer because basically this layer has some additional information, but it, there is too much noise. And it's better for the model to just skip this layer. <laughs> Yes? Okay. So using our method, we have managed to tune long, large language models uh, for long context. In particular, we have tuned open LAMA 3 billion parameter model with our method, and we have observed that our model, despite being trained with the context length of 8K, that is basically this, we have for maybe one comment, for those large models, we have uh, not picked one layer, but we have picked three layers. One in the middle, one before the middle, and one after. And, we have op and the con total context length seen by the, uh, those layers was 8K. Others lay for other layers, it was 2K, okay? So we have observed that our model is able to extrapolate, this is basically, um, we have picked a simple task that the model is given a pretty much nonsensical document. And inside this document, there is a hidden message. And we ask this model to retrieve this message. And we have observed that it can retrieve message from a document that is much larger than the documents that the model has seen during the training. Maybe a bit of explanation here. What about positionals in our models? Yes, <laughs> positional encodings. So basically, we keep positional encodings the same in all layers, but for this picked layer, in this case, three layers, we, picked, uh, we, we pick three layers here, we make that so for the local part, the positional encoding is the same as in the base model, but for the parts that uh, come before our local context, every key is encoded as if it was at the beginning of the sequence. It's basically as the context uh, is increased, there are no, no new positional encodings, yes? It's basically, everything inside the local context of the model is encoded as in the base model, and everything that is addition, in, addition to this, even in addition to this is encoded as if it was at the beginning, okay? So, you have also managed to uh, tune a seven billion parameter code llama model and prepare the mixture so that it has retained its coding skills and has better reasoning skills and better results in knowledge intensive task. Um, yes. And maybe a bit of a <laughs> uh, thing here. We have also prepared uh, instruction tuned versions of our models. That is basically, you can try our models in a free Google Colab notebook. And as, uh, here is an example of that. In fact, here I show uh, our seven billion parameter model answering questions about our research paper. <laughs> yes, you can try it yourself. I will give you the link in the end. Uh, what's worth noting here that uh, this is a speed up video, as you can see. Basically, we are running seven billion parameter model on the free Google Colab GPU. And in order to achieve that, we had to quantize it, yes. <laughs> As you can see, it can answer uh, some simple questions about the paper. Okay. And, okay. Okay, it can also tell you what are the main points of the paper, <laughs> main contributions. Okay, and the thing that I said before, the model 
uh, has also maintained its coding skills. But for example, here the, there is another part of the same uh, no notebook that we basically show that this model can do basic code refactoring. And basically it started from code llama, so it uh, should have some sense of co about the code. Okay. And, okay. Maybe a little bit of disclaimers here. Those models that we present are basically a proof of concepts. We show that uh, our method can be applied to extend uh, context of large language models. If you would like to use them commercially, they would need a bit more of work. Basically, we haven't applied any reinforcement learning with human feedback to them. And they uh, can, for example, generate uh, answers that are basically not true. <laughs> and be very confident in, in them. Okay, it's also worth noting that, um, that those are only seven billion parameter models, the largest one, and uh, so don't expect them to be as good as GPT-4, yes. <laughs> because basically, as you uh, probably have heard, GPT-3 is like uh, 175 billion parameters. And the Ramor says that GPT-4 is much, much large. <laughs> yes. Okay. And as I said, you can check our models uh, and also the code <laughs> for them. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Conrad. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Good. Uh, do we have some questions? Uh, maybe I'll ask first again. Uh, so uh, thanks for sharing the link to the repository. Uh, do you have any plans for uh, extending this work and uh, making better on, let's say, commercially ready, as you said? So maybe I shouldn't comment now about this, but... Uh, can we can keep it for the after party. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, what we are currently trying to understand more is basically how the preparation of the data affects the model's ability to handle long context. Basically, in the standard uh, data sets, you don't have too much of long documents. Basically, there are a lot of short documents and maybe a little bit of uh, longer documents. But it seems that in order to have really good long context performance, you would probably need something that at least approximates uh, those long documents. Okay. All right. And uh, do you think that it's possible and does it make sense to uh, try to extend the length of the context? Or it's uh, already quite long. Yes. <laughs> I mean, um, it makes sense basically with. For example, you can take uh, currently one of the good commercially available models that is CLOT 100K. And you can observe that basically what CLOT does is it allows you, for example, to compare to papers, yes? Mm -hmm. If you have really long context, you, uh, you could do, for example, compare to books, yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> write me a summary of this, uh, of, for example, Pantadeus, mm -hmm. <laughs> something like that, okay. All right. And are, are there maybe some uh, other similar models that are adjusted to long context? And do you, do you know how um, your model compares with them? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have compared with Memorizing Transformer. And basically, uh, we have the results in the paper. So I will maybe send you to the paper. Uh, the thing is that uh, this comparison with Memorizing Transformer is basically done on the level of perplexity. Because uh, the these models weren't uh, as big as, for example, se seven. I mean, we haven't got uh, access to <laughs> big uh, memorizing transformer models in order to compare them on downstream tasks. But you can uh, check the paper for perplexity results. Okay, great, thank you. Do we have more questions, Conrad? All right, so uh, you can find more details in the repository and in the paper that will be published at. New Rips, right? Yes. Very soon. Okay, let's thank once again Conrad for the great presentation. Uh, thanks uh, once again. And uh, I think that with this, so this was the last uh, talk for today.
uh, but uh, it's not the end of uh, our event because, as I said at the beginning, uh, you are invited to stay with us for the after party. Um, we hope you will enjoy it. Um, anything else? No, just to stay with us, have fun, and uh, maybe just one more announcement. Most likely we'll organize the next Warsaw AI event in January or February 2024. So we hope that we'll also see you uh, in our next events. Thank you once again for coming. Have fun.